building UIs can be complex. From managing the multitude of menus to building an engaging HUD, you can quickly find yourself with huge UI management classes controlling how we display data. Luckily, the UI Toolkit data binding feature helps us solve this problem by binding that data to some element on the UI so that UI will refresh as the data changes. This eliminates the countless handlers and the web of interdependent scripts that plague game UI development. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you. Ooh, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dream become a reality by helping you build more resilient UIs faster. Data binding has always been present in UI Toolkit, but as with much of the UI Toolkit documentation, especially in the early days, it was more oriented to the editor scripting component. It wasn't as much about the runtime UIs. So I wanted to take this video to show you how you can do this data binding for your runtime UI, which makes it much more simple for us to display some data on the UI. But what is data binding? Data binding is the process of taking any value, maybe a string, maybe a float, maybe an int, and binding it, hooking it up to the UI, where that field is now displayed on the UI, and as that field changes, it'll automatically update the UI. Now, this is what we call a one-way data binding, where we say this value, show it here. There's also two-way data binding, where maybe we would bind some value to an input field, and then as a player types, it'll update that value on this side. So you'd give it like a default value, player changes something, and it's automatically persisted over here, which then may be used somewhere else as well. This helps us not have to have like mono behaviors that pull a value every frame and bog down our performance by having to run update loops to update all these different values on the UI. Now, this is a great option for how you can display data to the player, but it does require that you have thought about at least how your data is going to be structured up front. And what I mean by that is maybe you've in your own project or maybe you've seen another project where data is just all over the place. I've got player and I've got like 15 different player scripts and they're all different components and they're all public and they're just pointing to one another. That's going to make this really hard to do. For this video, we're going to assume that you have a reasonably structured approach to your player data or whatever data you want to show, or at least it can be reasonably encapsulated into some structs or classes or scriptable objects. For example, you may have a unit SO that has some key data elements like the unit's name, how much life it has, its damage, how fast it attacks, this kind of stuff. And this will be familiar to you if you've been watching the gun series or the AI series. I pretty much always structure my data this way, and that makes it very easy for us to bind it to the UI. So in this example, we just have a unit SO scriptable object with some public variables. Nothing super fancy going on here. In Unity, it's going to look something like this with our damage, our attack speed, name, icon, all this kind of stuff. Now, a challenge comes in is how do we take these values and just automatically hook them up on the UI? On UI Toolkit, we can use UI Builder or just write our own UXML. We'll look at UI Builder first and then how we can use our own UXML. If we open up a UI Builder, I've already made this one. It's just a visual element and then some labels. I've given a name, name, health, health, a name of health, damage, attack speed, etc. So typically you'd say like name, say, okay, the text, I want to put this for the health. I might have 100, just go down the list, right? Giving them some values. And that's cool until we need multiple different ones of these, right? If we want to show multiple of them, oh, and we want to set an icon as well, maybe with the background image, take our Llama Academy logo. So we want it to look something like this and we have multiple different units. We either need a bunch of these different visual elements and we want them to maybe reflect in real time what's happening. This starts to become really challenging. That's where the data binding comes in. So we have the ability in UI Builder to set up this binding. Let me undo all of these changes for something like a name over here in the inspector. If we click on the text, we can say add binding and say, oh, hey, okay, this is going to come from, and then what's the path, and we can get hints if we select the object. We don't want to bind this particular field to some object. We probably want this whole element to come from the same object or unit SO. So on the visual element up here at the top of the inspector, you can say, hey, this data source is going to come from, and we can select a scriptable object here. I'll just select this instance of the unit SO, the llama. Then if we come down to the name where we just were, Notice that it inherits that data source. So then when we go text add binding, this gets pre-populated. When we click here, it gives us a list of the available properties. Hey, since we're talking about the name, let's bind the display name. So it's going to bind the display name to this target. 
And this is where we can set up the two way for a label that doesn't make too much sense. You can go one way the other direction. That'd be two source. That'd be if you want typing on an input field to affect the scriptable object value, but you don't want the scriptable object value to come back. And to target once, we just do it one time. So to target here would be perfect. We can say add binding. And now we see, okay, it's getting space llama automatically here. And we can't change it in the UI builder anymore because it's resolved this binding. This looks extremely familiar if you watch the localization video I did a few weeks ago. This is the exact same way that we can set up localization and localization works very well with binding this way as well. Instead of having a string or something like that, we can use localized strings and it binds those perfectly. I'll have a link in the description to that video where you can learn more about how to use the Unity localization package to add localization very easily into your own game. It works very similar to this. Now, this is how we do this in the UI builder. Let's take a look at the UXML, which is my preferred method of writing UIs with UI toolkit. I just find it's a lot faster. Now, up here at the top, we see that data source to our asset. We can see this is how we set the data source at the top level. And then down below here, we have the bindings under each label that we're going to assign, along with the data source path to the variable path on the bound object. So llama.asset up here is a unit SO, and we're saying we're gonna bind the display name property to the text value of this label. And what's cool is we can bind any property we want. Through the power of video editing, we can now see that our top here, our icon, we're binding the style background image to the icon found on our unit SO. The rest of these are all pretty straightforward because they're the exact same thing. The label, we had a bindings tag and then a UI data binding saying which property we want to map to, the data source path that we want to bind it to, and then the binding mode, which for just displaying on the UI, we want to use to target. Now, those of you who are paying really close attention will have seen that in this visual element, we're no longer saying which object we're getting bound from. Now that's pretty cool because what we've been looking at so far is a template. So in another UXML document, maybe your runtime UI, you can define templates with a UI template tag. We just give it a name and then the source UXML that we want to use, and then we can use those repeatedly in our UI. You can then create instances of that template with UI colon instance, providing a template name. That's the name that we gave it. And we can bind our data source at this level, data source equals, and then whatever asset that we'd like. And now in our runtime UI, we can see one instance of that UXML that we just saw. If you wanna learn more about how to use templates in UI Toolkit, I've got a link in the description to a video where I covered how to make templates and how to use them to build your UIs faster. Now for to change our health, let's say that's the 40, as we move this even not in play mode, we see it's updating immediately. All of this totally seamless instant updates to our UI without us having to write any code. That's really awesome. Now you might be asking, well, that works cool if I have scriptable objects. What if I'm not using scriptable objects? What if I just have mono behaviors? Well, the cool thing is it works the exact same way with a mono behavior. I've got this runtime UI script that expects us to have a UI document, that template, the UXML that we were just looking at, and then a mono behavior, unit mono behavior, that I literally copy pasted from the scriptable object. So it looks the exact same. We have the same fields, all that stuff. Now, if they're different, you may need different UXML templates with different data bindings, but conceptually, it's the same thing. What we're gonna do then is let's make it when we click that button, we add a new element to the UI based on this mono behavior unit. Well, to do that, we'll just say, okay, button, let's register a click handler, button.register callback, click event, accepts, and we'll just do an inline function right here. To add a new element in UI toolkit, we just do visual element, new element equals new, and then we can clone our visual tree asset, which is gonna be a project panel asset reference to the UXML we were just looking at. And we just do template.clone tree into that new element. And then UI document.root visual element .add that new element. Now for the binding, all we have to do is new element.data source equals unit. And because this template is looking for the exact field names that we have defined here on the mono behavior, if we come back to Unity, and we just have a mono behavior with that unit mono behavior. We hook up all of those references on the runtime UI with our UI document, our unit display, and that mono behavior. We click play and we click this button on top. There we go. We get that new element added. This one's behavioral llama. That's tied to this behavior. So if we change the attack speed, again, it's working the exact same way. 
So here we can see how we can very easily hook up our mono behaviors and scriptable objects directly to our UI where they automatically update without us having to do any code at all. In fact, the only code that we saw in this video was setting up this button click. The rest of it was just setting up the UXML structure and styling. I hope this overview of data binding in UI Toolkit has helped you understand how it works and how you can integrate it into your own project. I really like using UI Toolkit and I'm really happy to see that Unity keeps investing in making it better and getting feature parity with UGUI. If you got value out of this video and you want to show your support for the channel, you can check out my 22 plus hour real-time strategy game course where I teach you how to use Unity 6 to build your very own real-time strategy game. You can also check out my shader graph course, which is a great introduction if you've never touched shaders before on how to use a tool, what you can do, and how to make some pretty cool effects. You can also get yourself some Lom Academy merch right here on YouTube, or you can become a YouTube member or a Patreon supporter. Your recurring contribution there helps me out tremendously and gets you some cool benefits like recognition on every video, your name in the GitHub repository for every video, access to a private members exclusive Discord, as well as a shout out starting at the awesome tier like Ivan, Ifiobolus, Jason Hansen, Snedden, Trey Briggs, Will B, Mustafa, Nick5454, and Pixel Wizards. There's also all of these great supporters as well. Thank you all for your support, and I'll see you on the next video.